before lunch is my good friend Matt Geiger. He's been a pre uh, presenter at our conference since the beginning, so this is his third time coming. Um, I'm, I'm not going to not going to say too much except that Matt is uh, probably the youngest fund manager in the resource space. I believe he's 27 at this point, and uh, he's managing several million in the junior mining space. So a, a big time contrarian. Matt, we're going to push you to like 15, 18 minutes because we got to get to lunch. So good luck. Looks like we're cycling through the presentation already. Let's jump back to the beginning. Alrighty, so it's uh, great to be back here at Jekyll Island uh, with the Palisade group and friends. Um, as Colin said, this is now my third uh, Palisade conference, uh, and I really appreciate the opportunity to speak. Um, these conferences have always been worth my time, and each year they seem to be getting bigger and more star-studded. Um, and so before I jump in, I'd like for you to join me in a quick round of applause for Colin, Sean, Susan, Andrew, Karam. Thank you guys for putting this together. Cool. So today I'm going to take a step back and discuss the bull case uh, for natural resource equities uh, over a long-term time horizon. Now, I recognize in a lot of ways I'm preaching to the choir here, but I think after eight years of mostly misery, it's important to understand why those of us in this room with a large percentage of our net worths and natural resources are poised to do very well in the years ahead. So I'm going to cover what I believe to be the four most compelling reasons to be overweight natural resource equities in one's portfolio. The planks of this argument are as follows. One, favorable population and consumption trends uh, over at least the next three decades. Two, significant long-term performance of those holding minors uh, versus actual physical metals. Three, significant long-term performance, excuse me, when compared to equities generally. And four, um, the fact that resource equities at the moment are historically cheap relative to most any other asset class. So we'll start with favorable macro trends and more specifically global population. Uh, this chart shows the United Nations uh, projections through 2100. Um, given that I'm 27 years old, there's a chance, uh, knock on wood, that I'll be alive for the f uh, whole duration of this graph, uh, assuming that I can moderate my beer consumption going forward. <laughs> so here are the key takeaways on the population front. We're at 7.7 .7 billion people currently. And for some perspective, that's a 7x increase over just the past 200 years, which is pretty surreal. Um, using a 95% confidence interval, um, we can project that in 2100, we'll fall somewhere between 9.8 and 13 billion people. Um, even if we assume the low end of 9.8 billion people, um, which would peak in 2080 to 2090 uh, time horizon, this is projecting an increase of 2.2 billion people in just the next 80 odd years. For some perspective, it took 200,000 years for the human race to reach 2 billion people. And again, we're going to do that again in just the next 80 years. Now, I understand these are just estimates, and these no so these numbers can't be relied upon as fact. Um, it's impossible to predict with any certainty uh, the many variables that affect population growth, uh, such as improvements to health care, uh, quality of education, uh, woman workforce participation, uh, political stability or lack thereof food av availability, uh, cultural social norms, war, disease, famine, natural disasters, etc. The list goes on. So to be extra, extra conservative, uh, let's assume that the global birth rate drops by half a child starting today. This is barely on the realm of possibility, but just for the sake of argument, we'll do this. And if you look at the graph, it can be seen on the lower of the two uh, blue lines, so the lowest line. Even with this uh, extreme scenario, I'm not expecting the global birth rate to drop by half a child instantaneously, um, we can safely say that global population will continue its ascent through at least 2050. So that gives us three more decades. All right, so now we'll switch to the second half of the equation. And this is consumption on a per capita basis. Um, this phenomenon is harder to show in one graph. Uh, but the gist is that, aside from pretty much whale oil and mercury, pretty much every single commodity um, has seen exponential demand uh, growth since the hydrocarbon revolution began roughly 250 years ago. So even over long periods of time, a 1% to 2% annual growth rate can work wonders um, and, and, and result in what we'd call exponential growth. And this exponential growth phenomenon explains the astounding fact that we've actually pulled more metal out of the ground in the past 25 years than we have throughout all of human history combined, which is pretty shocking. And, and this is despite the fact that supply growth for most of the major metals 
have posted seemingly unimpressive one to, to two to five percent annual increases over the past few decades. But small increases year after year after year do lead to incredible results. So in my opinion, per capita consumption for your average human is set to increase year after year after year until we bump up into severe resource, resource constraints sometime during my lifetime. Why do I feel this to be pretty much inevitable? Well, it is explained by this graph put together by the World Bank, which shows that the world's elite 20% consumes nearly 80% of the stuff that we pull out of the ground, that we harvest, that we cut down. Uh, this won't be a surprise to those of you out there that are fans of the uh, Pareto's 80-20 rule. Um, Get this, in a given year, the average American fridge consumes more electricity than nine Ethiopians. Even more crazy, the United States expends more electricity just for air conditioning, as does the entire continent of Africa, for everything. These disparities are simply astonishing. Even for food consumption, which you'd expect to be slightly more democratic, we see the elite 20% consuming 70% of all meat, milk, and eggs. So why is this significant? Well, the simple truth is that the middle 60% are gunning for us. As the elite's future consumption increases will mainly comprise from services and premium brand purchases, the middle 60 still want the material comforts that those of us in this room take for granted today. And the implications of this are enormous. Some simple back of the envelope math shows that the elites uh, comprise 76% of consumption. And if the middle 60% only uh, comprise 22% of consumption, then the average elite currently consumes more than 10x more resources in a given year than the average person in the middle 60. Even if we assume that the material consumption of the elites is plateaued, the implications of this 10x uh, difference narrowing in the coming decades can't be understated. Unfortunately for the middle 60%, there's simply not enough resources on the planet to allow the middle 60 to live like the elites do today. So, before I move on to my next point, I don't want to belabor this, I, I do want to stress that total global consumption is a product of population and consumption on a per person basis. If I were to snap my fingers and double the global population tomorrow, as long as we consumed half as much, there'd be no change to global population, or sorry, to global consumption. But with this in mind, the current situation is that both global population and consumption on a per person basis are growing exponentially and have for decades on end. It may not seem like it on a year-to-year -year basis, but again, over decades and certainly centuries, this is undeniably the case. So it's for this reason uh, why I'm certain when I'm 80 years old, natural resource extraction will be just as relevant as it is today, if not more so. Barring a sudden voluntary change in behavior on a global scale, which I regard about as likely as an asteroid strike, the only realistic resolution in my lifetime is that the price of most commodities will rise in real terms to the point that people are forced to change their behavior. So we'll jump to the second point here. This won't be far less long-winded. Uh, in light of the demographic and consumption forces uh, discussed, some might be inclined to go buy a bunch of metal and lumber and agricultural products and go house them in a warehouse, wait for 30 years, and then you'll become rich. Well, that's, that's not the answer to capitalize on this trend. Um, this chart, which was compiled by one of my investing heroes, Jeremy Grantham and his team at GMO, and I appreciate Brian for shouting him out recently, um, shows that real prices, which are aka inflation adjusted prices, of nearly every industrial metal has actually fallen over the past 90 years. So you see aluminum down 1.7% in real terms, you see iron ore down 0.2% in real terms, you see lead and zinc down 0.1% in real terms. Only copper has gained over the past 90 years and, and just by a very slim margin. So even though the prices of nearly all these industrial metals were down over this time period, if you look at a basket of the diversified miners over the same period, you saw an 8.6 per annum return in real terms. So, and also, while the MJG fund does not dabble in oil, natural gas, and coal, for illustrative purposes, it's worth noting that the same phenomenon holds true for that industry. Um, if you look at the price of oil um, relative to the oil producers, over this 90-year period, oil went up 0.5% per annum in real terms, while the actual oil and gas equities garnered a substantially higher return of 8.3%. So, what are we seeing here? There are a few explanations. Um, the first is the simple concept of the equity risk premium. Um, in essence, the principle is that the, high, the more risky the asset, the higher the returns. And it's undoubtedly true that buying these miners are significantly more risky than buying the underlying metals. However, 
the disparity in returns, at least over a long-term time horizon, demonstrates that buying the equities are very, very much uh, the, worth the risk. Additionally, equities, well, at least the larger ones, generally offer the following advantages. They're cheap to trade, they're uh, liquid, um, there's a diverse set of business models to choose from, and you can also goose your returns by doing value stock selection. Um, so to be clear, if we were to look out 90 years into the future from today, uh, my guess is that the real prices of the metals I just mentioned uh, will actually be up in real terms, maybe 2 or 3% per se. Um, if this ends up being the case, though, I would expect the returns of the underlying equities to, even, to, be, to do even better, so maybe in the double digits. I see no reason why the equity risk premium should be expected to compress in the years ahead for mining and extractive industries. So jumping to the third point here, and this chart uh, is also from uh, GMO and uh, Jeremy Grantham's team, uh, this might surprise uh, many in this, in this room. As can be seen, over the past 90-odd years, the energy and mining companies in the S&P 500 have actually outpaced the industry itself by 2.2% per annum. And this is despite the many instances of corporate malfeasance and questionable acquisitions and just poor decision-making across, across the mining space, we still see this outperformance over a very, very long time horizon. Now, my immediate reaction when I saw this chart is that this difference in performance uh, must be down to survivorship bias. Maybe the mining companies that have survived have posted higher returns, and this isn't really what's happening. But then when you think about it, the S&P itself also suffers from survivorship bias at the same time. So uh, this is real outperformance over a sustained period of time. And due to the population consumption trends I've already discussed, my bet is that this performance delta of 2.2% actually widens in the coming years ahead. All right, so now I'll discuss the fourth point, um, and that's that resource equities are historically cheap relative to most any other asset class. Unlike the first three planks, this is specific to this point in time and makes the value proposition of resource equities particularly compelling. This chart displays a ratio of the GSCI index relative to the S&P. The GSCI is comprised of 24 commodities across the spectrum, energy products, industrial metals, precious metals, agricultural products, livestock, what have you. We can see that the ratio is at a, has fallen to a level not seen in the past 50 years. And just as importantly, the dramatic plunge in the ratio we've witnessed since 2011 seems to have bottomed out, and we seem to be bouncing along the bottom. As Marin in the back of the room is fond of saying, don't try to catch a falling safe. Instead, wait for it to hit the sidewalk, bounce open, or bounce around and break open. And if this safe hasn't broken open yet, then it will very soon. This next chart uh, paints a similar picture here. Um, and I'm running low on time here, so I won't belabor it. Um, in this case, uh, it indicates that real assets are at 92-year lows relative to financial assets. Uh, to be clear, real assets here uh, were considered uh, resource equities, commodities, timberlands, collectibles, and U.S.-U.K. housing. So this isn't a perfect proxy for resource equities, but I think it illustrates the broader point. Resource equities are historically cheap relative to most every other asset class, and for those of us that believe in mean reversion, we can expect to see that in the years ahead. So, now the fun part. I presume the majority of the audience isn't interested in parking their money in Rio Tinto, BHP, Glencore Tech, and a couple of the other big boys, and waiting patiently for 30 years. We're here for the junior space, which is a beast of its own. In a broad sense, junior mining investors will benefit from the four things we've previously discussed. As population and consumption on a per-person basis continues to grow, we're going to need many, many more mineral discoveries in order to satisfy the middle 60% as they continue to try to live like we do today. Plus, when the diversified miners do well over an extended period of time, as they're poised to do in the coming years, the joy inevitably trickles down into the junior space. So what we have already discussed does have relevance to us as junior mining investors. But that said, there are some key differences between the big boys and the juniors. The first is that the vast majority of junior mining companies are not un investable under any circumstance. This includes the lifestyle companies, this includes management teams run by frauds, cheats, and should-be criminals. This includes uh, companies burdened by debt, uh, companies with untouchable share structures. There's a whole host of reasons of, of why you should avoid most of the juniors. And of the majority, uh, of the remaining company, and for illustration's sake, we'll say the remaining 20%, most of the remaining aren't investable without the inclusion of a full, long-dated warrant. Only a very, very small percentage, say the top 4 to 5%, are, worth, are worthy of open market buying. 
So it should go without saying that a quote unquote basket approach to the junior industry is a recipe for failure. This includes buying the TSXV, GDXJ, or any other proxy to get exposure to the space. And this also holds true if you're enamored with a particular commodity. If you like uranium, going out and buying the top 40, the 40 uranium juniors listed on the TSXV and the ASX is a recipe for disaster. It's okay to have preferences for a given commodity, but you have to concentrate your best on, uh, bets on the best of breed stories and forget the rest. So another thing specific to the junior space is that GNA is wildly out of control. Despite the recent, or ongoing depending on your uh, view, uh, mining bear market. A recent internal study by Rick Rules Group at Sprott Global looked at 75 sub $10 million market cap juniors and showed that roughly 60% of the money raised went to GNA over a five year period. This is just insane. Meanwhile, ma major mining companies generally allocate 10 to 15% of project expenditures to GNA, which many in this room would say is, is too high already. So um, this is another illustration of why juniors should be handpicked and, and not bought in a broad basket. And as a final principle, this is a game of saying no and also not yet. Given that 80% of the juniors are uninvestable under any circumstances, it stands to reason that you're going to be saying no eight out of 10 times right there. And of the remaining companies, most will deserve a not yet for any one of many reasons. They might not have enough cash to complete their next milestone. Uh, there may be a four month hold or escrow period lifting in the coming months that you want to wait for. It may not be a fit for your specific portfolio. There may be a de-risking event that you're waiting for. There may be superior opportunities out there. There are many reasons to say not yet, even to good stories with good management teams. So to wrap this up, I want to quickly explain what I'm doing with MJG Capital to capitalize on my long-term conviction in resource equities and experience within the junior space. The fund has a strict natural resource mandate. And we hold between 15 to 25 positions in the portfolio at any given time. Right now, about 80% of our portfolio is exposed to mining, with the remaining 20% in either cash, agriculture, or aquaculture, other resource industries that fit our mandate. All of the MJG Fund's limited partners have committed to 10-year lockups on their original investment. This lockup is in place to exclude all but the most patient capital from joining the fund. This is essential in a space that's this volatile and this cyclical. So I'll run through this quickly. This is what we look for in investments. First, we need management ownership in double digits. Skin in the game is absolutely essential and protects against a whole host of problems, including excessive GNA, unwise project expenditures, unwise acquisitions, unnecessary dilutions, a whole host of other problems. Two, as mentioned, low GNA relative to peers. Just by looking at the single metric, you can quickly root out and discard the lifestyle companies by purely looking at um, monthly expenditures relative to what a company at that stage should be doing. Three, you need to see a major catalyst achievable before the next capital raise. Or better yet, you want to see multiple catalysts before the next capital raise. Or even better still, you want a company that doesn't need to raise capital, either because they're cash flowing or because they have a fat working capital position that can sustain them for over a year or more. Um, also, we look for high quality experience management working within their circle of competence. In this industry, you have to bet the, the jockey over the horse every time. Apple or Google could get away with a mediocre CEO for the next four to five years without there being a major hit to their business. But in early stage businesses such as junior mining, biotech, Silicon Valley tech, you're making life or death decisions for your company on a day to day basis. You need those people to be aligned with you and you need them to have previous success. I also need the investment to offer attractive fundamental or expected value. If it's a speculative bet, I want to see at the very, very minimum 100% upside if things go my way. And if it's one of the more conservative Ben Graham value investments that I, that I call them, um, I'm okay with slightly less upside. And finally here, I do have a distinct bias towards the prospect generator and royalty business models. The reason for this is simple, dilution. Dilution is the bane of the junior industry as a whole. These business models are built to reduce or eliminate share count dilution, which is why royalty co's and prospect generators have often outperformed your general, your typical junior mining co. So final slide here, uh, here's a quick look at the fund's performance over the trailing 36 months. Um, it should go without saying that past performance is not indicative of future success. And given that 80% of our exposure is uh, junior mining at the moment, things can move sharply in either direction very quickly. That said, I'm 
uh, the fund significant outperformance of the bin, uh, industry benchmarks is heartening, and I'll be busting my butt to keep up uh, these returns going forward. That's allowed. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you, man. think you understand the junior mining sector and you think that the participants in the mining sector, junior mining sector, are good people and kind people, hit the bid. How violent that term could be, it actually could be quite violent. Uh, it could be a rip your face off uh, uranium rally. And the world is always going to need raw material. It's going to need copper and gold and nickel and so forth. Totally destabilized. Hey, hey, troll, did you hear what's going on in Yemen?